Hey y'all, welcome back. So today we are going to be taking a look at Genesis 10 and Genesis 11. If you're new to my channel, I upload faith-based videos and Bible studies pretty regularly. So make sure that you subscribe so that you can follow along with us and you do not miss out okay so last time we took a look at genesis 8 and genesis 9 we have came out of the flood with noah and his three sons japheth shem and ham and we saw the curse of canaan pass from noah to ham's son and we dispelled that curse and some myths that have been going on about it in some ways that it's been misused in that video today we're going to focus more on there is a genealogy in chapter 10 and we're going to kind of just speed through that and point out some things that are important for us to know. Everything is important for us to know, but things that stand out. <laughs> and then also we're gonna look at Genesis chapter 11 a little bit more in depth. So get your Bible. Of course, I'm gonna be using the NIV and follow along with me. Okay, so as we're looking at this, again, we're gonna keep in mind that this book is being written and told to the nation of Israel. And so it's important for them at this time to understand where they came from, how they came about. And so today we're gonna look at this trace of genealogy all the way from Noah to Abraham, who is the father of Israel, the father of the faith. All right, so Genesis chapter 10, it is entitled in my Bible, the Table of Nations. And so there are three different nations and all of these nations come from Noah's sons. So there are the Japhethites, the Hamites, and the Semites. Of course, the Semites, you will recognize that name because this is where Jewish people come from. Okay, so the Japhethites, we're just going to name the fathers that are listed here. The sons of Japheth. Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Taras. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Torgamar. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, the Kittites, and the Rhodonites. Now Japheth spread to the north and to the west. Now we're going to skip down to the Hamites, the sons of Ham, Cush, which Cush is interchangeable throughout scripture. Um, whenever the word Kush is used, it's interchangeable with Ethiopia. So Kush or the Ethiopians, Egypt, Put, and Canaan, the sons of Kush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Ramah, and Sabtega, the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. So Nimrod was a mighty warrior, but he was also the father of uh, Babylon and Assyria. So we know that these people fought vigorously throughout scripture against the Israelites. Um, verse nine here says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, and Kalna in Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh. Now Nimrod, a descendant of Ham, founded this great city. So this is another way to dispel the myth of the curse of Ham. And we know the book of Jonah fiercely focuses on Nineveh because Jonah is given the task to go to Nineveh to try to get them to repent and turn to the Lord. And he doesn't want to do that because they're known to be such wicked people. And he knows that if they do repent, because the Lord is so gracious and so merciful, that he will forgive them. And he doesn't think they deserve that forgiveness, right? And so um, I encourage you to read that book because you'll get a lot of insight about Nineveh, who eventually does repent and turn to God and their sins are forgiven. Okay, I'm gonna continue on. From that land, he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kalah, and Rezin, which is between Nineveh and Kalah, which is that great city. Egypt was the father of the Ludites, Anamites, Lehabites, Naphtuhites, Pathrusites, Kasluhites, and Kaphtarites. Canaan was the father of Sidon, Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Arkites, Sinites, Arvidites, Zimorites, and Hamathites. And so all of these listed are Canaanites, and we see Canaanites over and over again throughout scriptures as well, who are rising up against the Israelites, continuously battling them. And like we said before, we know that God ordered them to be completely destroyed, and you can read more about that in the book of Joshua. And so the passage goes on to explain where these people settled, and we know that these are um, the African nations. And then to go on to verse 21, it is entitled the Semites again. So Shem is the father of the Semites, 
who are the Jewish nation, the Jewish peoples. The sons of Shem are Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, Aram, the sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Meshech. Arphaxad was the father of Shelah, and Shelah the father of Eber. Um, Eber was the father of Peleg and Joktan. Joktan, the father of Almadad, Seleth, Hazar Meveth, Jarah, Hadoram, Uzol, Dikla, Obal, Abimel, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. Ooh, I'm proud of myself because a lot of these is like hard name, hard name, hard name, hard name. Okay. Verse 32. These are the clans of Noah's sons according to their lines of descent within their nations. From these, the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. So if we take a little pause here to just remember and think on what we've learned so far in scripture, one of God's first commands to the man and the woman was to multiply and fill the earth, not just be in one part, in one concentrated city, but to fill the earth, so to spread out. This is important to keep in mind as we go into chapter 11. Now, 11 verse one. Now the whole world had one language and one common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves, not God, but make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So people don't want to be scattered over the face of the whole earth, despite the fact that this is what God commanded, this is his intentions, and this is what he has already said to them. Verse 5, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And so we see that people were trying to rebel. They were being disobedient to what God had commanded them. But God's plan will always prevail in the long run. So he had to make an alteration. He confused their language. And ultimately, they had to be scattered over the whole earth. They could no longer understand each other. And they spread out and filled the earth the way that God had intended it in the first place. I also want to point out in verse 7 when God says, come let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. God came down to meet the people and also he uses a plural adjective. He uses us and not I. And this is just indicative again of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so to understand the Trinity, we understand that God is one, one in essence, yet operating in three persons. And this is why we see plural adjectives used throughout scripture. So verse 10 and on goes on to explain another genealogy from Shem's line to Abraham. And we understand that Abraham is the father of Israel. And so this is so important for the audience at the time. It makes sense, right? If this book was written to Israel, which doesn't mean that it's not for us, that it's not for our consumption, of course it is. But if this book was written to them, this would be extremely important to have listed here. And so we see a zoom in on this genealogy, whereas the genealogies before were kind of vague and over a few centuries and people are named over time. This one zooms in so that you can see exactly where Abram came from. And we know as the father of the nation of Israel, again, this is vital information. So I'm gonna start at verse 10. This is the account of Shem's family line. Two years after the flood, when Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arphaxab. Arphaxad became the father of Shelah. Shelah became the father of Eber. Eber became the father of Peleg. Peleg became the father of Reu. Reu became the father of Sarug. Sarug became the father of Nahor. And Nahor became the father of Terah. Terah lived 70 years. He became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And I'm kind of speeding through this as well. But as we see here, Terah is the father of Abram. And just a little side note, Abram's name means exalted 
Father. The irony, right? <laughs> and now I'm going to begin reading word for word again at verse 27. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. We see Lot mentioned as well a lot throughout scripture and his journeys with Abram. And now we understand their relation that Abram is the uncle to Lot. Lot is his nephew. And so that can explain some closeness um, there. Verse 28, while his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Very important to keep that in mind for further study. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. So they were on their way to Canaan and Canaan is the promised land. But they settled in Haran and Haran is modern day Syria. So for some reason they stopped there. Now, what are our major takeaways from this reading today? If you follow me, you already know one of the questions I'm going to ask you is what does this set of scripture say about God? What can we learn about who God is and about his character? We see that God, even after destroying the earth because of the wickedness that existed here, making a promise to never destroy the earth again and making a covenant with Noah that is set in a sign of a rainbow, we've learned that he's a God of mercy, the God of forgiveness and grace. And we see that when we zoom into this scripture, that he's continuing to fill the earth. In chapter 10 of Genesis, we see these genealogies, the fathers of these nations. And so there are nations and nations of people coming out of Noah's sons. And then when we zoom into chapter 11, we see people rebel again. They want to make their own name great. They don't want to fill the earth the way that God intended. They're disobeying again. And yet, God stays faithful to his promise. He doesn't destroy all of the earth again. He doesn't start over again. Yet, he implements a plan to stop this disobedience and to set his original plan back into order. And so people are spread all over the earth. People are filling the earth. People are continuing to multiply. And so we just see that God can be trusted. He's faithful to his promises. He's faithful to his word and what he said. We see that God is merciful in spite of disobedience. We read this section of scripture and it's like, you are blatantly disobeying God and trying to play God, yet God's plan still prevails. And I think that's another huge takeaway that we can take from this segment of scripture, particularly the Tower of Babel section. How often do we disobey God? How often do we try to usurp his authority and try to implement our own plan, blatantly disignoring the plan that he has for us? God's plan for us is better than the plan that we've had for ourselves. When we put God on the throne and take ourselves and our wants and our needs and our desires off <laughs> and we allow God's desires for us to just lead us and prevail in our lives, the fruit of that is just incomparable. It's important that we obey the Lord and it's important that we walk in his ways. And so I just want to make sure that I emphasize that as well um, in your Christian walk. So I hope that this has helped you better understand this segment of scripture. And I hope that you will tune back in to continue walking through the scriptures and studying it more deeply with me. Thank you guys so much for watching. See you next time. Bye.